want to welcome you to the lecture series, Relative Time, Little Time, that the Dutch artist team, Vic van der Paul, developed in collaboration with our journal. And before I thank our sponsors and introduce our two speakers, I want to acknowledge the traditional land on which the University of Manitoba campuses are located, the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the traditional homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you to our sponsors, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the University of Manitoba Conference Sponsorship Program, and lastly, the Faculty of Arts, the School of Art, and the Institute for the Humanities, all at the University of Manitoba. We'll have a question period at the end of the lecture and realize you will be recorded. Your consent is appreciated. Our speakers have, um, are, have agreed to answer your questions. My co-host, Carolyn DeCorno, Mosaic's managing editor, and our conference assistant, Timothy Brown, will unmute you. It's always appreciated if you can ask your questions with cameras on, but not a necessity. Lastly, I remind you that on Monday, February 7, at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, we have an exciting set of lectures by Drs. Arthur Anyaduba, Melanie Braith, Sean Singh Nataru, Melanie Dennis Unrau. Their lectures will span the topics of decoloniality, the Six Seasons Project, noise, and petrol poetry. I think it will be a very interesting discussion. Now, to welcome our invited speakers, Marina McDougall and Dr. Stephen Duval. McDougall is a curator working at the intersection of art and science specializes in interdisciplinary approaches in public educational environments. She was the founding director for the Center for Art and Inquiry at the Exploratorium, the first curator of art and design at the CCA Wattis Institute for Contemporary Arts and co-founded the Studio for Urban Projects. She's been a visiting curator at the MIT Media Lab, the Museum of Jurassic Technology, the California Academy of Sciences and the Oakland Museum of California. She's recently been appointed as the VP of Experience and Engagement at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. We welcome her. Um, Stephen Duval is an artist and researcher with a focus on the relationship between specialist and non-specialist identities in relational and collaborative art practices. He has shown his work nationally and internationally and was a founding member of the Pedagogical Research Collective Proto Academy, where I first met him so many years ago in Edinburgh, Scotland. In 2019, Duval co edited the, the book Hybrid Practices Art in Collaboration with Science and Technology in the Long 1960s. Um, Marina and Stevens lecture today is titled Arts Ecosophical Imperative. Please welcome Marina McDougall and Stephen Duval. Hello. Let me just get started here. Hello. So I'm Stephen Duval, and this is my working collaborator, Marina McDougall. We are here to talk about our project, The Ecosophical Imperative. Hello, and um, thank you for the invitation to participate in Relative Time, Little Time. We're looking forward to a generative conversation, and um, we hope our presentation will stimulate ideas among all of you for the conversation that follows. We will begin with this provocative set of questions still so relevant to our current moment from Guattari's Remaking Social Practices. How could we agree upon common projects while respecting the singularity of individual positions? 
by what means in the current climate of passivity could we unleash a mass awakening? Will fear of catastrophe be sufficient provocation? Emphasis must be placed above all on the reconstruction of a collective dialogue capable of producing innovative practices. Yet without modifications to the social and material environment, there can be no change in mentalities here. We are in the presence of a circle that leads me to postulate the necessity of founding an ecosophy that would link environmental ecology to social ecology and mental ecology. We first started working on this project, um, what we've termed um, the ecosophical imperative as an entry into the super studio project for the Green New Deal. The Super Studio was a national call for proposals orchestrated by the Landscape Architecture Foundation in association with the McCarg Center for Urbanism and Ecology at the University of Pennsylvania, the Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes at Columbia University, the American Society of Landscape Architects and the Council of Educators in Landscape Architecture. Making the claim for the importance of landscape architecture in any Green New Deal. The Super Studio aimed to address questions such as, how can the Green New Deal framework translate into real projects? What parts of the country should be prioritized for these projects? What will Green New Deal projects look like? Who will the projects serve? And how will they be implemented? Marina and I uh, both came out of the arts, me as an artist and curator and Marina as a curator. And we felt that the arts have been neglected as a valuable contributor to such a potentially transformational project as the Green New Deal. Seeing as the visual and performing arts and education played a crucial role in the initial New Deal, we felt that this has been a gross oversight in the national dialogue and that a case for the arts and any Green New Deal needed to be made. So let me move on here. So art is integral to how humans create and conceive the world. Therefore, if the Green New Deal truly aims to recreate how humans conceive of the world, art's presence within this new conception is imperative to reimagine our place within the natural world grounded in reciprocal interdependent relationships would require alternative ways of knowing, one that can visualize cities and towns with equity, sustainability, and care at the core of a reimagining. A conceptual framework of place that addresses a continuum between rural and urban contexts requires new apprehensions on a macro and micro level Guattari called this a transversal approach to seeing the world where ecology is seen on social, mental, and environmental planes. Art has the ability to traverse these planes and integrate itself into an ecological restoration project, public messaging campaigns, interdisciplinary pedagogical approaches, or a boots on the ground public works project. It is our goal to put forth the case for art's inclusion in any Green New Deal project and demonstrate how historical and speculative models can inform a transversal framework. So we're gonna just go over our conception of what these sort of three ecologies are and how we sort of see art fitting into it, okay? So mental ecologies, art as a way of awakening subjectivities. So the interior life of a Vermeer subject the social relations of a faith Ringgold mural or the ecological despair of an Alexis Rockman landscape all do deep dives into those ecologies to make people think about their places within them. This is of course to use, only use examples from the visual arts, but anyone who has engaged with a performance gotten lost in a novel, suspended their disbelief watching a movie or enjoyed the vista from a well-designed building will tell you there are many ways to unfold complex ideas for your average human being. If we are to turn the tide of the climate emergency, we will need to persuade as many people as possible that pulling in the same sustainable, equitable, and ecological direction serves to protect our fragile place in Earth's habitable ecology. Without the arts, how will we unfold the ecological imperative for our species in this moment?
When Guattari talks about creating subjectivity, he is invoking the Althusian model of subjectification. Althusser famously talked about how the state can impose subjectivity upon a citizen. And he used the example of a policeman running down a crowded street yelling, hey you, at which time every person becomes a suspect of police authority and the state. An artwork can do a similar action, but only if you engage with it. It doesn't scream, hey you, but it does perform an action of by implicitly asking a viewer or participant to find their place in the constellation of positions around its quote object of knowledge as Paulo Freire would call it. By asking the participant to create their position on the role of community farming in the inner city, for example, a whole system of social and mental, mental and environmentally ecological questions spring forth in a way this person may never have thought about before. Imagine a photographer on the scene of a works project that is creating an ecologically sound human waste system. How might the process be photographically documented in a way that elicits a subjectivity about the project, its goals and process? Clearly, this creative process isn't confined to the arts alone, but the plethora of practices within con the contemporary field of art practice do readily lend themselves to the production of subjectivity. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Pardon me. So social ecologies, art as a way of cultivating social relations. The, so I'm gonna just start with uh, a quote here from, from Rancier. The artist's emancipatory lesson, opposed on every count to the professor's stultifying lesson, is this. Each one of us is an artist to the extent that he carries out a double process. He is not content to be a mere journeyman, but wants to make all work a means of expression. And he is not content to feel something, but tries to impart it to others. The artist needs equality as the explicator needs inequality, and therefore designs the model of a reasonable society where the very thing that is outside of reason, matter, linguistic signs is traversed by reasonable will, that of telling the story and making others feel the ways in which we are similar to them. So in this quote by Ranciere, he describes the empathy he feels the emancipated artist brings when stripping, stepping forward, excuse me, to every viewer or participant. This is where the artist can bring the social ecology to a project by showing the viewers how they might relate to a project and create their own subjectivity in relation to it, a subjectivity that is based on equality regardless of station in life. And uh, I also wanted to share at this point a little quote that uh, Dominic Petman, yesterday's speaker, uh, happened to uh, put out there into the ether today from Ursula K. Le Guin. Uh, the artist deals with what cannot be said in words. The artist whose medium is fiction does this in words. The novelist says in words what cannot be said in words. And I, I thought that was uh, rather apt. But I also would like to take a point to look at this particular work by Felix Gonzalez Torres called Untitled Perfect Lovers and that was produced between 1987 and 1981, which consists of two identical clocks um, that will eventually fall out of sync with each other as their batteries die. And eventually one of them will stop working until, and then eventually the other one stops working. And of course, this was done at, at, at a moment in time uh, during the AIDS crisis. And um, yeah, I'll leave that in, in, in the spirit of Ranciere, I will leave that there for or everyone to interpret it in their own way, but I believe it's a, a, a very empathic work that sort of illustrates what we're talking about. Environmental ecologies, art as a way of attuning to place. So objectively, of course, the various ecosystems that sustain life 
on the planet proceed independently of human agency, just as they operated before the hectic ascendancy of Homo sapiens. But it is also true that it is difficult to think of a single such natural system that has not, for better or worse, been substantially modified by human culture. And nor is this simply the work of the industrial centuries. It has been happening since the days of ancient Mesopotamia and its co with writing with the entirety of our social existence. And it is, it is this irreversibly modified world from the polar caps to the equatorial forests that is all the nature we have. And this is of course, Simon Shama, the historian from landscape and memory. So as he points out in this quote, humans have been modifying the environment long before industrialization. And many of our first cultural artifacts are on the walls of caves or carved into the land and our cultural relationships to it go beyond our ability to acquire sustenance from it or refine it for material wealth. We have a cultural connection that links us to the environment because we have always been dependent upon it. It makes sense then that art should be a part of the reaffirmation of the environment's importance to our survival. So the image that is before us is Michael Heitzer's double negative, which is uh, located in the Moapa Valley on the Mormon Mesa, <clears throat> also known as the Virgin River Mesa in Overton, Nevada. And uh, double negative was created in 1965 by the artist Michael Heitzer. And the work consists of a long trench of earth, 30 feet wide by 50 feet deep and 1500 feet long created by this displacement of, or the displacement of 244,000 tons of rock. Two trenches straddle either side of a natural canyon onto which the excavated material was dumped. And the negative in the title thus refers to, in part, both the natural and man-made negative space that results from the work. Now, the reason that I brought this to you is because I, I have been there myself. The, the image makes you realize in two ways how we make a mark on the earth in, in such a massive way. This little dot that you'll see right here is, is my father. Um, and what I've always loved about this picture is the enormity with which the world appears next to the singular human being. And of course, even next to the human, this massive excavated space is still dwarfed by the world, the larger world around it, which is quite powerful. While we have become estranged from our immediate environments through extraction and consumer culture, we arise from the earth, we belong to it and are interconnected with it. Through the arts, we can become thoughtfully and creatively re-engaged with our landscapes. So before we move on to talking about um, other stuff, uh, we want to just sort of add a little addendum. Um, so there are two ways that we envision that an artist can participate in any Green New Deal project. Working at the core of a project as a lead artist, project manager, or serving in a more ancillary role as a project contributor. And before we go on about artists as the core driver, we think it is important briefly to state its alternative. The ancillary role has many exemplar, exemplars from the late 60s to the present day. And in some ways, many people will think of the arts only in terms of traditional methods, but contemporary artists do more than just draw and paint. Some of those other methods have historical precedence, like the artist placement group, experiments in art and technology, or art, the art and, tech, art and technology project at LACMA, and have provided enough examples to fill several books. This is still a still from the artist Ian Breakwell while on a placement at British Rail using footage he took from train services. So while he was in a train, et cetera. And then, so he used being at British Rail as the sort of source for creating the, the work itself. So APG co-creator John Latham's notion of the incidental person, which is a person whose job it is to engage with the institution but without a predetermined outcome is useful when considering what ancillary roles an artist might have 
in a drainage water project or the installation of a solar energy farm or an electrical transport project. The artist isn't driving the project, but the project is the source of inspiration for the artist. And here I would also just add that the artist's creative thinking and imagination can help to frame questions and inform the underlying conception of the project. So to um, inspire some of the framework um, from Guattari that, that uh, Stephen just shared, um, I wanted to um, now turn us towards um, some historical and contemporary projects and practices that we'd um, that we shared originally in a three-part series that we organized at Slot Public Trust here in Philadelphia, uh, th thanks to the kind collaboration of Aaron Levy and its many contributors, um, including artist and educator Sarah Lewison, who I think is joining us today and, and hopefully can share more later. Um, so the first day, um, next slide, Stephen, thanks. So the first day, Roots, Art, and the New Deal in the 1930s centered around the history of the arts and the New Deal. Um, next slide. Billy Fleming of the McCarg Center in the Landscape Architecture Program at UPenn um, and initiated our series by describing the premise and incredible ambition of the Super Studio Project where landscape architecture studios across the country, um, many conducted in university contexts, researched and developed proposals for a potentially Green New Deal. Thousands of proposals were created and exemplary projects were identified by a jury this past fall. It would be fascinating if a project like that were to happen um, through arts programs, um, just like yours, um, you know, across, across uh, the country and, you know, in Canada and Europe, of course, these conversations are taking place um, and maybe have a different focus, such as like the new Bauhaus in Europe. Um, next slide. We were also joined by Richard Walker, director of the Living New Deal based in the Bay Area. The Living New Deal was initiated to document the lasting legacies of the New Deal as manifested in the physical landscape. Um, and over time has become a crowdsourced project. Uh, as you can see in this map, um, those are projects that people have documented. Um, so it had started in California and then um, the, the um, Gray Brecken who was at the beginning of the project realized it was just too big of a project for a couple of people to take on. Um, so the group shows the relevance of the New Deal today by gathering archival materials and contextualizing its research. It's an excellent resource for understanding the economic and cultural context behind the New Deal, its many sub-programs, how they were orchestrated, and the projects that resulted. Next slide. Uh, media theorist David Goldberg um, also joined us to speak on the complex cultural legacy of the New Deal documentary photo photojournalist Gordon Parks as just an example of you know, one of the many artists that were engaged in the original New Deal. Parks documented issues of poverty and civil rights and later became the first African-American to produce and direct major motion pictures creating the black exploitations genre. In tracing um, Park's work, both during the New Deal and later into his career, Goldberg's presentation revealed how the cultural impacts and reach of any future Green New Deal engaging the arts are vast and unknowable. The next, next slide. So the second day was focused on inspiring educational projects from the 1960s. Uh, next slide. And here, Sarah Lewison presented on the Parkway School Without Walls. Um, in Philadelphia, a project conceived by the visionary educator John Brammer and administered by a lottery through the Philadelphia Public School District. The program for high school students recognized the vast shortcomings of public education and intended to serve, um, that, that it had intended to serve, and proposed a brave liberatory alternative. Um, which was then, which then took place in public institutions throughout the Benjamin Franklin Parkway, which are right in the center of the city in Philadelphia. Um, classrooms were held in civic institutions such as City Hall, um, as you can see in the center, uh, the Franklin Institute on the left, which is a science center, and the Philadelphia Museum of Arts. And there's a graduation ceremony taking place on the grand staircase on a, on a, uh, work by Christo. Next slide. 
Uh, Saul Mar Mar uh, Perez Martinez, an architect interested in urban pedagogy and based in the UK, presented on 36 urban study centers created in the UK in the 1970s and 80s. They were developed to improve citizen engagement with their built environments. The project conceived by urban planners, architects, and educators, including, including um, anarchist writer Colin Ward, um, was inspired to imp improve the engagement of citizens with their built environment. The program, encouraging active citizenship, aimed to expand people's spatial perception and guide them into a critical inquiry of their surroundings. The network of informal centers, uh, next slide, shared a bulletin, next slide, to put communities in conversation with one another. And now Stephen will describe um, project Gallery 37. Yeah, so um, this is a project near and dear to my heart because I was there and I was part of it. So, um, so a project that drew heavily on the history of the New Deal arts initiatives was the Chicago-based works project or program Gallery 37, funded by the city's Department of Cultural Affairs. The program established in 1991 provided young people ages 14 to 21 with summer jobs training in creative fields such as painting, printmaking, architecture, playwriting, wood carving, and African dance, to name a few. The project drew its name from the site it was initially located, the infamous Block 37, an expansive property in Chicago's loop that had yet to be developed. An apprentice artists, as Gallery 37 called its student participants, earned minimum wage working 20 hours a week under the supervision of practicing artists and creatives. Teaching artists who ran the different classes were recruited from local arts and community organizations, as well as schools. Students were chosen based on their experience and desire to develop skills that could lead to careers. The objects made by apprentice artists were sold at gallery th the Gallery 37 store or installed in public spaces, such as public train stations, community and social service centers, and Chicago's airports. The project was funded by both private and public money. Gallery 37's annual budget grew as large as 4 million by 1998. Initially, it employed 260 youths for the summer of 1991. And by 1998, Gallery 37 had expanded into the city's neighborhoods, parks, and schools. It employed 3,000 young artists and held classes at 65 sites outside of the city center. Roughly 8,000 jobs were created in the first eight years with approximately 1,500 in the summer of 1998. Nearly 350 artists were employed annually as teachers and the arts program had connections to 29 different agencies. But of course, um, you know, after, after sort of heyday and, you know, the change of government administrations, it is, it's been, you know, it's it shrank quite a bit, but it's it's still going, but in a much much smaller capacity. So, in, in the final session, methods, contemporary art, and ecology, we asked several contemporary practitioners to describe their methods and how they serve as models for how the arts might contribute to any green new deal. Uh, Susan Schwarzenberg, director of the Exploratorium Bay Observatory. Uh, uh, a great colleague of mine um, presented on um, on the Bay Observatory, uh, a glass box on the edge of the city and the San Francisco Bay, a hybrid space that serves as a gallery, a space of convening, and a place for scientific monitoring, bringing publics into an understanding of the immediate landscape. Um, and here you see a, a library of earth anatomy um, by artist Elena Halperin. Um, there are a few more slides, I think, that show the, you know, this is a wired peer, the project that invites different scientists to use the space as a, um, as a, as a place to, to, to gather data. Here we are, some of the data gathered, and I think there's a picture, an image of, oh, um, artists are commissioned to develop projects often as part of interdisciplinary teams. This is Amy Balkin's Guide to the Atmosphere um, that is, uh, came in the form of a poster. And then next slide. 
And here um, are people gathered for a series called Conversations About Landscape. Um, so, you know, people who are involved in policy, artists, poets, um, it, it's been running for a long while. And it's um, one of the few places in the city people can, can come together um, and really contemplate all the complexities of uh, Bay Area ecologies. Next slide. We were also joined by Rostin Wu, co-founder of the Center for Urban Pedagogy, a New York City nonprofit organization that illuminates the built environment to help everyday people engage politics. Um, so this is a, a, a number of photos from a workshop that is called What is Affordable Housing? So students go out into the city and do research. Next slide. Um, they gather information and create an art, you know, they're working with um, designers, including information designers. So they might create data visualizations such as this one. Next slide. They create models to help them, you know, kind of further their understanding. Next slide. And then they take their findings and they put them into kits that are distributed to other high school students. Um, so the organization um, um, begins with these simple questions that then eventually end up, um, you know, in engaging students in city politics. So it's a really, um, in a way, inspiring form of civics education. Next slide. Uh, Rob Buchanan um, also joined us, an educator in the Billion Oyster Project. Um, he described how this inspiring community science project grew out of the Urban Assembly New York Harbor School. Uh, the school located on Governor's Island has four maritime career and technical education programs in boat handling, professional diving, aquaculture, and ocean engineering. Edu um, next slide. Educators at the school seeded a highly, uh, a highly visible um, community um, science project to restore the historic oyster populations to the New York Harbor and bring attention to waterway health and climate resilience. Um, we're currently looking to this project in Philadelphia um, in relation to our native, native um, mussels. Next, next slide. Next slide. That's an um, example of some of the data that was, has been gathered through the project. Next slide. Finally, um, uh, artist Amy Franceschini and um, architect Loda Rankin of the International Art and Design Collective Future Farmers shared several projects from their practice. Uh, future Farmers projects such as Victory Gardens reimagined the possibilities for ecological futures. Their projects such as, um, next slide, uh, Flatbread Society Bakehouse in Oslo, Norway, see the conditions for self-forming emergent communities that actively engage in the places that they inhabit. Uh, next slide. Next slide. I've been working with future farmers um, in a multi-year public art project here in Philadelphia related to the Philadelphia Urban Tree Plan that aims to increase tree canopy in the city, particularly in low canopy neighborhoods. We've been exploring how the methods of arts and culture can integrate with city policy to inspire uh, greater community connection and engagement. Um, and here is a, a group of, uh, we have a drummer, a woodworker, and an artist all making um, these slit drums. Next slide. That were used in a um, performance called the Summoning of the Future Forest with the Sun Ra Orchestra. And uh, the drums were inspired by um, the lightning drum. That is a, kind of a great story where a, a drum was hit by lightning in Germantown neighborhood of Philadelphia. And Sun Ra um, told uh, James uh, Jackson that he should make a drum from it. And so, um, so he did. <laughs> and, uh, and so we decided to um, some, make some drums uh, also from trees that had fallen in, in this arboretum where our Pro project is based. Um, and those have been taken out into neighborhoods. Next um, slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is another tool we've made. Um, oh, it's, a, it's leaf printing with a seesaw. <laughs> Next slide. Next slide. 
And here, these things are all coming together um, at a tree planting. There's the seesaw making leaf prints, and um, you can't see it there, but there are drummers also. So kind of bringing attention to, um, you know, um, the, uh, tree planting that would normally be um, may, maybe just have less like social glue around it. Um, next slide. So, um, so we'll start to wind up here with um, going circling back to Guattari. Um, it is hoped that the redevelopment of the three types of ecological praxis, praxis outlined here will lead to a reframing and a recomposition of the goals of emancipatory struggles. And let us hope that in the context of the New Deal, of the relation between capital and human activity, ecologists, feminists, anti-racists, et cetera, will make it an immediate major objective to target the modes of production of subjectivity that is of knowledge, cultural, culture sensibility, and sociability that come under an incorporeal value system at the root of the new productive assemblages. So to close, um, you know, um, just to say that in infrastructure funds are um, starting to be made available to cities here in the U.S. And um, while while it hasn't been necessarily, um, in, you know, stated overtly that the arts will get funding, and we, um, you know, probably we probably won't we will probably won't see a great increase to our say national endowment for the arts um we do know that universities and different organizations will have access to these funds and um you know i uh, guitari was a was a champion of the idea of these heterogeneous types of projects that i think we've been able to kind of show that here that um depending on where you live projects can take form in many different kinds of ways and so um, perhaps uh, people who are understanding the value of arts and culture can integrate, um, integrate artists into these projects, um, sim similar to what is happening with uh, the project I'm working on now with the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. Um, Stephen, did you want to add any remarks as we conclude? No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm ready to have some questions. Thanks very much, um, Stephen and Marina. Um, Carolyn and um, Timothy are happy to um, unmute anyone in the audience. If you have any questions, um, just raise your hand, your Zoom hand, and um, we can begin a discussion. Thank you very much. We took you through quite the tour of ideas and projects. I hope your heads aren't spinning too much. <laughs> Great. It was really nice. So many um, local, like really kind of boots on the ground kind of projects, and as well um, ones that I'm completely unfamiliar with. Um, can, can I ask you one? question to begin with, given um, the way you frame things with Guattari, um, um, you know, like the kinds of cross, you, you, you mentioned like, you know, the kind of um, uh, the, you were speaking about the, the attempts to get around certain kinds of binary inversions and link up um, ecologists with feminists and anti-racists and um, you, you know that kind of attempt that that um, Guattari was trying to do to align all sorts of different forces and um, on different um, politics progressive politics but these days you know it's like the the damn hippies are sometimes anti-vaxxers you know it's like how, how do we, how, I mean, like, how do we navigate these kinds of like cross wirings of like incremental moments of progressive politic with other forms that are not so nice? I mean, and how do you navigate those kinds of questions on the ground, I guess? Because 
uh, anyways, that, that would be a, a, just a kind of general and as well as specific kind of a question for both of you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I would say that, um, you know, it's, I mean, Guattari talks about this um, to some degree, but I, I, I think, you know, what you have to do is the, the more that, that, that uh, let's say a green building project has uh, an artist group or an artist or whoever, whatever it is, you know, it's hard to prescribe obviously, but that is amplifying some sense of communication about what the goals, desires, needs, et cetera, of, of a project like that are to a, the broader community. I think that right there is, that's how you combat, you know, uh, misinformation. That's how you combat the sort of massive, you know, uh, mass media, you know, Joe Rogans of the world, et cetera, is, is by doing, doing things that are actually more directly involved with people's lives. Um, you know, if you're talking to your community and you're, you're making a project and someone starts talking to you about the reasons that they like this, that, or the other, you know, they're, they're starting to find their way in terms of seeing how they, what they feel about a certain subject, right? So let's say it's a uh, water waste or something like that. You know, water waste is really useful for human beings, right? We, we, we have to get rid of it. I mean, that was one of the big things of, you know, industrialization was, was sewage. Um, and, you know, when you start putting it into those terms, you know, Green New Deal stuff doesn't seem like, you know, it's about, uh, you know, tree hugging hippies. It's about things that I need in my daily life. All of a sudden, there's a new subjectivity that is created about it. And, you know, obviously, this isn't necessarily spreading as far and wide as certain mass media vehicles are. But I guarantee you, it's probably having a massive impact on those people in those in that neighborhood. And the more those people are involved in understanding what's going on in a project like this, I think the more they're likely to support and uh, have their minds be, I wouldn't say changed because, you know, this is, if anything, it's, it's, it's uh, I wouldn't say it's hard rhetoric. I mean, he's not advocating a hard rhetoric. He's advocating one that's, that's about a kind of egalitarian discussion, right? One where we're not closing voices out of the discussion as well, right? So if you're anti-vaxxer, hippies come and start telling you they dislike what you're doing, you just talk to them about what you're doing, about how it impacts their life in a positive way, et cetera. And you hope that that starts to have some impact, right? And not, not to discount people. And I think that's one of, the, one of the great successes of capitalist rhetoric at the moment is that we are so divided and incommunicative with each other that we, we aren't having these discussions. And, you know, because obviously once we start to talk to each other and start to realize common goals, desires, et cetera, that's when things start to change. So I hope that answers that question to, to a degree. Yeah. yeah. I think I've found also that, you know, the arts when they manifest somewhere in a, in a city and um, it's maybe not, necessarily touching the lives of people steeped in the arts and gallery goers, et cetera. Um, there's something about something manifesting that doesn't have any practical application that has some ambiguity, it's quizzical. And I find people kind of start at that place of asking questions. So it's sort of, uh, it, there's, it's a kind of, so somehow, and maybe those who aren't interested just self-select out and those who are curious start self-selecting in. So I haven't so much encountered the cha the, those, those challenges. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, some questions from the audience. Uh, has anyone indicated um, with their hands? I can't see Carolyn or Timothy. Uh, not thus far. Um, I had a quick question. Um, right. I was just wondering um, if you had, um, it's like in, in your work when it comes to visual arts, if there were strategies that worked better than others, like um, um, is it like initiatives and art groups that work better than say uh, going into a gallery and just exploring like a single piece or a single series? Um, or if there are 
are um, visual aesthetics that work um, to kind of like create these connections. So I think that's a great question. I um, and I think every artist has their own approach to this. Um, you know, um, future farmers, I'd say, have um, I, I kind of think of it as agit prop. You know, and they're very intentional about the ways in which um, they want to engage people through um, kind of unusual aesthetics. Um, um, but but. Um, you know, you know, something like the Center for Land Use, which might bring you into a place on a tour or something like that, um, almost has a very neutral, um, almost like a federal, um, it, it would like, like the, the language that say a, a national park in the US might speak in, um, as a way of pro probably trying to gain access and just, um, and just have a space for the research. Um, so I, I, it's such a huge range in terms of that, I find. Um, and and I, I find it fascinating to kind of discuss that with people. I, I know Rostin Wu of Center for, uh, sorry, Center for Urban Pedagogy um, loves data, loves visualization, is a big believer in um, how actually when you engage students um, and ask them questions and they need to, they, they begin to manifest their responses in physical forms, you start to understand what you see, what you see manifest, what you understand and don't understand. Um, if somebody were to ask me to make a drawing of uh, where the Schuylkill meets the Delaware River and how those rivers flow, I would, <laughs> I would botch it, you know, so then it, it piques my curiosity and then I want to kind of understand it better. Um, so, so I think, I think that's a, a really, I, I think it, there's so many options in that, so many good Good, good approaches, yeah. Um, you know, I, I would I would add to that that um, you know, it depends on a lot of you know contingent things about a project. I mean, I think when a project is at at its core, it has you know, it's an art project at its core. It would need to be very engaging with with local people, participants, etc. But I think when a project is more ancillary, um. You know, there's a number of methods and aesthetics that can be used. I mean, I think photography is quite uh, powerful. You know, uh, painting can be useful. I mean, I think a lot of different kinds of ways of of creating work um, can be useful. And all of these ways of of working in terms of the arts are really about opening windows and doors for you know people to see in and enter into what's going on. Whether it's something that is really, you know, is true is is a art project at its core or whether it's like an engineering project or an ecological project. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like the inclusion of the arts in, in these kinds of projects is important because it allows people to understand what is going on and what is important. And, you know, that's, that is the, the ways in which, you know, artists have for the longest time been, you know, about communicating with people about things and trying to say, well, look, this thing right here is what I find really important. And I'm trying to sort of through imagery or aesthetics or whatever it is, or, or writing or any number of things, I'm trying to show that to you. And hopefully you'll see what I'm, what I'm saying, or at the very least have a position in relation to it. And so, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of possibilities with, with that and that there's no really one prescriptive way or one prescriptive aesthetic that, that um, would work here. Timothy, it's also um, making me think of the um, regal attire of the Sun Ra Orchestra uh, during the performance that um, that they held. We held as part of this summoning the future forest, um, and its kind of connection to the cosmos. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it it can go in just like pretty much every direction. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, it looks like Sean has a question in the chat. Sean, I don't know if you want to um, ask it uh, instead of just me reading it or if you want me to read it out. Oh, uh, I think it was pretty much answered. I was basically asking what if there were any specific aesthetic practices that you've seen that might 
get people into the door um and yeah like for example people who are walking around in their communities and different tactics i guess of public performance art and things like that i was wondering if you had any examples but you pretty much answered it already so thank you i mean just to you know uh elaborate further i you know i would say that in you know the arts expanding their toolbox is always a better thing you know if there's a way that an artist can find to communicate whatever the 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 situation is and um, i mean that's part of the whole creative response to a particular situation is is trying to find the best way to communicate to people why they they feel that it's important so you know if it's performance which you know, I think is really, you know, can often be quite engaging, you know, then, then that's, I'm sure that's what an artist would do if they felt that was the best, so. Stephen, it might be fun to share um, your perspective on a social mirror, Merle Ukulese's project of the, of the, of when she was the, she was a artist in residence at the sanitation department in New York City and um, wrapped a, um, a garbage truck in, mirror so that people could see themselves reflected in their own waste um but, but, share but it wasn't an actual but but they actually had to get permission to 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 drive it in the city because because it was so reflective it would blind people when the sun would hit it it would blind drivers and so forth it wasn't a very practical uh garbage truck although it did reflect obviously the people who need all of the waste in on its sides but yeah so it's really just an art piece now that's for but yeah it was a, it was a it was a good project i mean she she had a long i don't know if she still does have a, a residency there that's like ongoing at the department of sanitation in new york city but yeah that goes to show a real obvious dedication to a particular project as well you know, to continue um, with Sean's um, question on aesthetic practices and your answer, which um, brought on the question of expanding the toolbox available to artists. Um, when I think of, of, of the possible kind of um, range of um, things we now um, consider an aesthetic object or practice from, you know, something in the gallery, a painting maybe, to like the, the kind of social practices which you were um, 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 presenting to us with, and then somewhere in, you know, somewhere close to the social practices, the sign, but then people working in a garden or like an, like, having an artist on site to actually, you know, speak to and address and respond to concerns or uh, uh, of someone in the public. I mean, uh, it's, it's a real, it's really important, it seems to be, to be able to be seeing people on, on the site um, working and have that dialogue immediately to like, you know, circumvent any kind of obstacles or problems which might immediately come up when we're dealing with the art field you know it's just kind of bleeds out into the everyday and um, um, it kind of um, militates against the kind of issues that I originally was raising you know and that you responded to so nicely you know like let's talk well you know it's, well and I but I think this is also where I am you know, uh, the, the, the visual component of even a socially engaged artwork is, is still, um, you know, it is a, it, it is a visual communication with, with, you know, signs and signifiers that, that are being, you know, uh, shown to people who are reading the work in that way. But, you know, there are also people who are reading the work and coming towards it as, as, uh, participants and you know obviously the 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 big question about whether you know um 
you know, their subjectivities are, are being created. Um, you know, that kind of interpolation of, uh, of, of subjectivities is, you know, it depends on whether, you know, someone is being, is, is genuinely engaged with the process or not. I mean, if, if someone doesn't even, you know, is walking by and is somehow um, symbolically in front of a, you know, a, a socially engaged project, it doesn't really mean a whole lot, but if they start to talk to the people there, then all of a sudden it starts to become something that is is really meaningful. I mean, I have I have read criticism of of this kind of um, subjectivity being created, um, that sort of talks about it as some sort of like trap that people that artists are trying to uh, get get participants in, and I I think that's really um, that's a kind of bad faith argument about um, creating subjectivities and so forth. I don't think that that's really what's what's sort of being what's sort of as an aesthetic what's being created, and um, and of course you know uh, you know if you talk to anybody who's done any kind of dis interdisciplinary um, work they'll say you know like if you work with a scientist or if you work with an engineer they'll you know an artist who's working with them will will immediately start to talk about the aesthetics of those individuals within the project that suddenly start to manifest. So I mean. It's for me. There's a there's a kind of natural aesthetic that also comes from the nature of of projects, um, and and that is something that is is also really um, I think good and positive, because it's something that then also makes it much more truly collaborative and not just the the um, the realm of the artist, but something that that really comes to being more of a collective venture, which is of course what. What Guattari is kind of talking about, I think, in terms of like this transversal way of viewing the world that seeing the symbiotic relationships that we have with each other and, and how we are connected and how we should, we should use that connectivity to help us find our way at this moment of climate crisis, if you will. I'd be also really curious to hear how people have been, when they think about the potential for um, art in relation to the Green New Deal, what kinds of images kind of come to mind or, or ideas or models? Um, you know, I, I think that the question about visual aesthetics uh, also makes me think about, um, you know, the relationship between art and education that in many of the things that we've discussed in terms of bringing people into a place. And um, I've recently been able to work with uh, the sound artist, Anaya Lockwood, who is uh, and does environmental sound. And I've been learning about the way in which like a health of an ecology can be related to the liveliness of the sound. So for example, if she's got a hydrophone down in the river and there's a seawall, it's not as, you know, you can't cure fish, you can't, lots is just missing from that ecology. And, um, you know, so, that might not have a visual aesthetic, but it has this kind of kind of point of entry into a into an environment. And um, and you know, would a would a Green New Deal with arts engagement that you know include sound artists? I, I'm you know, I just think we from the 1930s were in such a different place in what we've seen um, kind of in, as, as we've seen the way that arts have evolved. Um, you know, what what do we need? What could it look like? I mean, I see the value of a Anaya Lockwood and, and her, uh, that kind of sound practice inspiring others to kind of go out and, and attune to their local landscapes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's, I think one of the things that we've, we've maybe um, not touched on as well, it's really important is that, um, you know, all of this, this uh, stuff that we've been gathering is, is uh, meant to uh, take the form of a publication. And, you know, it is a, an attempt to practically see if we can um, convince lawmakers in the US that this is something that they should consider when, you know, whether it's, whether it's, uh, you know, a town hall where people are, are, um, you know, hopefully have some money and might be able to think that an artist could come and participate in something like that or, or you know, what have you. But what, you know, it's meant to be a, a, a document that that is in support and makes the case for the arts inclusion 
in in these things because it seems as though it doesn't look necessarily like the arts are going to be legislated into a lot of these projects and so it's going to be on a really local level that that might happen and hopefully this is something that can be useful in that regard Uh, Sarah Lewiston has her hand up. Sarah, would you like to go ahead? I was trying, almost, almost just as Marina started to talk, as I was trying to figure out how to frame up the question, listening to Stephen and some of your concerns, Shep, I was thinking, just as Marina started to talk about, but how or what, what or how does this idea of art as also being a form of pedagogy, which in a way makes, uh, sets uh, almost, yes, all of the projects that you've shown us apart from other kinds of works we might have looked at, which are also, well, you know, which take, which take more work or education to be able to engage with. So even if you think about the double negative of Michael Heiser, that takes us out or an abstract painting or a representational painting. It's like the, the art that well, in my generation, we grew up to see it, it, we, it takes a certain, you know, until fluxus almost a certain kind of like prior knowledge to be able to really appreciate it. And, and, uh, and you know, even me growing up in a middle-class household that was well-educated, I, I remember as a child looking at paintings and going, what am I supposed to see? What am I supposed to feel? What, you know, and, and now I know I'm an artist. So <laughs> it's like, the more you know about the 19th century, the 18th century, the more you get from this work. So um, it's about context, but that notion of context is kind of the importance of context text, which is also ecology like it, an environment or environment, you know, like if you go think about Bateson's, you know, like what, if I'm the smallest unit, then I'm, I'm, it's me and my environment. That is exactly what's concealed from us. That's exactly what's always, always already hidden. It's always already part of our environment, our education in the West, in the, in the, in the system of education. That's not the system of education that you allude to Shep when you give your very beautiful um, uh, uh, talk about the uh, you know the lives of, of the of the prior of the first Americans of the prior inhabitants of this of this land of this world and so I wanted to in terms of pedagogy I guess I wanted to know because because there was this talk about no it has to be visual I was wondering but but why? I mean, what what is it we're actually being called to experience or see or feel with many of these works? Like, what is it? What is the call? What is the what is the ask of the of the viewer? That's for you guys. And I mean, you can think about it in terms of the pedagog if pedagogical aims, like to maybe break that down a little bit more. And maybe there's multiple. And maybe you said it, and I'm. And, and, and it just, but that means, let's say, I think we just need to keep saying that over and over again. Yeah, I, I mean, I think with, um, you know, I, I think with that, it, it's, it's about seeing um, pedagogy as less of a transversal, I mean, a transference of ideas and more of a, a, a relearning and engaging together and, um, and the idea of that, which I tried to sort of use with that Ranciere quote, which is about the, uh, which is, comes from his book, The Ignorant Schoolmaster, and um, talks about the emancipated artist. And, you know, and then this notion that, for Ranciere anyways, that, that the artist brings forth, and he's talking about, you know, these works that you're talking about that, that you say require um, prior knowledge to enter into, um, you know, like a, a, a painting or a photograph or something like that, an image-based work, he would say that, that the artist brings forth that and allows anyone to interpret it, right? And, and I would agree with him to a lot. I mean, in part, because what I would say is 
the interpretation of someone who has no knowledge of art before and comes in and has a look at this artwork is entirely subjective and up to them in the first place, allowing people to have their own opinion and whether it's good, bad, or indifferent is very much a part of what um, Guattari is talking about. If we would like to have uh, an egalitarian society, then we can't sort of dictate terms about what things mean or what they don't mean. And it comes to a, a point where if you want to meet people as equals as an artist mm -hmm. or meet people as equals as, as someone who's coming forth, then you have to allow other people to interpret and find their position in the constellation of ideas, whether that one is aligned with yours or not. So let's take the anti-vaxxer, for example. You know, let's say we're making a work and there's some sort of thing to do with, you know, telling people how to think about vaccinations is exactly what makes, you know, this sort of polemic already start to begin with. So if you allow it to be open in a way, and you allow people to find their place in the constellation of ideas, then you can start to have a, con a conversation about where they stand, what their subjectivity around a particular subject can be without telling them what it should be. And I think that's very much what Rancière and Guattari are trying to um, talk about is, is if we are to engage with people, then it, it can't just be one-way traffic. We have to attempt to engage people and and talk about things in a way of learning together. So, you know, Frieri is very good about this and he talks very much about learning together or, you know, for, for a teacher to relearn around the object of knowledge in a way as if they were, were uh, approaching it for the first time on their own with their students. And what if you do that, then you start to, then people who've never looked at an art object before and they're bringing things to the discussion that you've never thought about before all of a sudden you are learning about that object afresh. And I think that's what's really important is just, is about trying to sort of take away this sort of stultifying as uh, Rancière calls it uh, lesson and trying to open it up so that there's freedom within the discourse for people to find their own positions rather mm -hmm. than dictating. And I think that's part of a really, that's a really important part of uh, Guattari's ecosophy and his notion of the transversal. Hopefully that makes sense. I think there is also um, a complex difference between representational art and what I would just call maybe um, you know inquiry inquiry based art. Um, because and I think it I think one of the I think one of the challenges you know most people think of representational art. When they think of art, they think of the noun of art. They don't necessarily think of the verb of art, all those amazing gerunds that come with it, you know. Um, and um, and I think that, you know, uh, kind of. I, I think our talk. We. It, it's interesting that you asked that question, Sarah, because Stephen and I actually had some debate about this as we were preparing. You know, I thought should we keep everything within a kind of framework of environment, or you know, and really, Stephen insisted that we go back and forth and not only show socially social practice work. Um, and I think any, you know, if I think about the National Endowment for the Arts in, in the US, despite its lack of funding, it does an excellent job of supporting kind of art in every kind of possible configuration, whether that is um, craft or, um, you know, uh, Indigenous art, it doesn't create hierarchies if it's if it's an exhibition, if it's um, you know, you know, if, if it's in a it's 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 like it's like everything is possible. And and I think that sort of democratic idea that Stephen is referring to, and that I think when when that that term heterogeneous really resonates with me when um, that Guattari uses that these things need to manifest in many different ways. People need to have a lot of freedom to shape. Them, whatever these projects are. If the arts, you know, I, I'd be curious in Canada where you have much better federal funding for the arts, um, you know, how you navigate that. But I, I for, to me, art and, a, and a, any kind of Green New Deal would probably have both, even though I, I, I'm quite an advocate of 
if you're gonna have people on the ground, um, clearing ground, restoring rivers, et cetera, I would love to have artist designers involved. And I would love, the, uh, I would love those participants to be actively engaged in understanding what they were doing in a broader context of human ecology, rather than workforce development that doesn't include that. So, you, you know, if you look at the urban assembly school in New York, it's pretty wonderful that those students engaged in kind of vocational training also have this giant citizen science or community science project next to it where oysters are this kind of charismatic entry point into a wider connection to understanding how your stormwater connects with your, <laughs> um, you know, um, your, um, so you, you know, the, the, those two water systems are, are, are conjoined. And, and that is, and also starting to understand what the natural habitats are or what the original, you know, underlying natural ecology is. It's just, um, um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of losing my thread as I wander off here. I mean, no, I just wanted to respond. No, thank you for both of those answers. And I mean, I think what, it, you know, that annoying way sometimes when you ask a question, you feel like you already know the answer. I mean, it, I just think that there's so much about these projects like that, that are that are about uncovering really who you are. If they're not necessarily trying to convince you They're It's like, it's almost, it's material facts, but in a really seductive, convivial context where these, the material facts of your life, of like we're, if we are, are an organism plus environment, then the material facts of our lives are reconnecting with that, you know, that not just the organism, not just our eyes and our brains, but mm -hmm. all of these other parts. So um, they're, they're also such good examples because that, but what they do is complicated, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was someone um, who had a good um, contribution in the chat. Let's see. Uh, Melanie Dennis Unrau, do you, would you um, ask your question or would you prefer if I read it out? Uh, I, I can speak. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I was just actually responding when Marina was asking about what artistic practices we think of around the Green New Deal and um, I'm involved with some community organizing so I'm just aware of how much art making goes into things like staging a protest outside a bank with someone dressed up like the Monopoly man and a pipeline that has been made out of paper mache or whatever right so uh, that's sort of what I was thinking about and writing slogans, making signs. I know our organization, the Manitoba Energy Justice Coalition has a puppeteer or a, not a puppeteer, a puppet maker as part of our group. So she contributes all kinds of neat things. So I guess it's more of a comment, but I just thought I'd share that. Thanks. Well, you know, it's it's interesting, one of my favorite parts about the Billion Oyster Project is that it, it wasn't at all ever conceived as an art project. Um, and yet it seems to me like it fits so well within what you would call socially engaged art practice. And I think oftentimes people are, you know, engaging in creative uh, ways of, you know, making things happen, making it more vibrant, making all kinds of stuff go on, especially, you know, like in a protest or, or what have you. And, um, I'm not really, I guess, I'm not really bothered about whether it's called art, right? I mean, there's so many wonderful things that are happening that are creative, that are outside of art. Um, but it would be so nice also if there was some room for, for artists to, to come into those places where there aren't those creative endeavors already happening. And I think that's the thing, because what you've pointed out to me is, is also like how important those people are within the process of making a really vibrant, communicative protest that is showing people the ways in which you know you care about these things and you're hoping to communicate that to people and um you know i i think there's a lot of things that you know the the drudgery of you know like a human waste project 
you know, need, it needs a creative individual that's in there as much as it needs in some ways, you know, someone who really understands drainage. You know, I mean, it's like, those are two, you know, I think it, it's just important to also see the roles, the, those important roles that, that people can play in those projects and, and help communicate to a wider group of people, you know, the, the really, that, that, that the, the mathematician who's like working on certain kinds of things is doing really creative things. They're just not being sort of brought forth for people to see other than in the minutia of the, of the project. And I think that's very much why the artist is a kind of important figure in, in some of these things. You know, and um, adding to your point, Stephen, um, the project that I'm undertaking with Future Farmers Street Work, um, normally when people are brought into a conversation about proliferating the urban forest in Philadelphia, they will take a course um, if they get that deeply engaged um, with the Phil uh, Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. And I, I hope my co uh, collaborator, <laughs> institutional collaborators wouldn't be insulted, but I often think of that course they give as a little bit like going to the DMV. You know, it's very um, pragmatic. Uh, you, they describe trees as kind of environmental resource um, or, or environment, what's the term? Um, the, yeah, the, the ways in which um, trees kind of, in, you know, what environmental services, that's the word, to us. Um, you know, they provide shade, they um, pull water up, um, you know, prevent it from going into the um, sewer. They, um, they do all kinds of things for carbon sequestration, et cetera. You know, they prevent gun violence, et cetera. It's, but it's, um, yes, um, Sarah's saying they monetize them. They, 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 they justify them in terms of economics. So um, by, you know, the, the arts are, are another way of like really shifting perceptions. Um, in our project, we ended up talking to a uh, scientist who studies the Devonian and how, you know, the emergence of life on earth from, you know, algae. And, you know, so, you know, there's like such a different, some in, in tree, you know, thinking about trees outside of their individuality is something that many people are thinking about now, their kind of interconnection to mycelium and other organisms. And, you know, you can, and, and, and Sun Ra really got us thinking about trees and their connection to the cosmos, um, to the sun, you know, so there's like many more exciting ways to think about trees. And I think sometimes culture can kind of bring you into that more rounded, fully, um, more human, and um, you know, I don't, I, Sarah used the word um, seductive, just um, poetic, lyrical, other modes of thinking that we find enchanting. I'm, I'm, I was kind of um, realizing how hard it is for to get my head around these things when I typically treat, you know conventional art history. And what occurred to me was that the kind of collaborative endeavors um, you bring to us um, are, or can be thought of as um, a model or a mirror to reproduce ecologies which are not in abundance. I mean, if we think of, um, Bateson's idea of an ecology of weeds or that are hidden away as Sarah was suggesting and which we are inextricably kind of connected to. Mm -hmm. A lot of work at, you know, at the, at the grassroots level, local level and um, wow. Sometimes you can get the funding in Canada, but not, not always. <laughs> it's yeah. tough. I, um, I mean, I don't think, I don't think it's a, a easy time for the arts anywhere. Um, I think, you know, the, 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 the constant justification for our existence has never been more present. Um, and I think, you know, 
one of the things that we should be unashamed to sort of uh, to talk about is is all of these things that we we the arts really bring to a, a kind of you know projects that are not would that would maybe traditionally be seen as rather boring or whatever, but because it adds value to those, it it makes people realize that you know these important things that are happening um, in your local environment are 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 occurring and that you should be happy that they're happening and guess what there's some really you know uh dedicated determined people who are there and the arts have a way of humanizing those things and making them really tangible for people um not that that should necessarily be the only way that the arts can justify their existence i do think at the core of a lot of the projects that were mainly artistic projects, the ones that are social, you know, socially engaged projects, which, you know, I I happen to really appreciate and and think are invaluable, you know, are things about, you know, connecting communities together, you know, trying to get people to see their community in a different light or see the value of connection in their community, connection to the environment and all of those things. Um, and as many of those things that anybody can get going, I say, great, let's let's go, right? But if it does mean that to justify the the inclusion of the arts and these kinds of things, that the the ancillary role of the artist has to be uh, more, you know, is more proliferate. I think that's fine as well because I think having you know artists in all of these different kinds of places is is a fantastically subversive way to do some really important work mm -hmm. and you know as john latham and apg point out on a constant basis when you know they were in you know working in in big corporations or working in you know houses of government you know places you would normally think of as uh you know typical artist residencies and yet the artists that were there were making really important work with, with material that doesn't often really get to be exhumed. And, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that's, that I think can be really, really important. And the more that these things happen, the better. Um, and, uh, you know, as James Lee Byers said when he was at a, the Hudson Institute think tank, um, buyers, he did like a ticker tape thing of like, um, you know, where the stocks come in. And it said, you know, buyers in the Hudson Institute is the artistic product. The very placement of the artist within as a sort of virus within the this sort of very, you know, destructive system, if you will, the Hudson Institute in particular, you know, that's, you know, war gaming, you know, different scenarios <laughs> for the government, um, you know, is a really important thing to happen. And these, these are the ways in which the arts can help in insert, you know, some sort of human value in a place where human value is being pushed out as well. And, and I think that's also really important. Um, but, but maybe that's, you know, the, I'm saying the quiet part out loud of what we're supposed to be talking about here, so. Um, if there's no more questions, um, is there any more questions? I put everyone on the spot then. Thanks for all your participation. Um, the audience, great, great questions. Thank you, and Stephen. And Marina, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation and a very enlightening um, question and answer period. Thank, thank you so much Chef, for the invitation to participate in this series. And we um, really appreciate a chance to share these ideas. And, and um, you know, I mean, I, I, I think I, I think that, you know, the reasons why the arts maybe thrive during the New Deal, um, yeah, there's probably a, a big question that we could contemplate moving forward is like, why have the arts not been more central to conversations of the Green New Deal? You know, when um, in the New Deal, they were so central. And I think it, I think it might go back to your earlier, um, uh, um, your er earlier pointing to these kinds of divisions 
you know, it's, I, I think it's a hard time for national unity. And that's what, um, that's what, that's kind of one of the reasons why they, I, that's one of the reasons why they were um, seated in the first place for the New Deal, so. Yeah. yeah. And I'd also like to say, you know, we don't, by no means um, are we the only people um, attempting to sort of do this. And I, and I would say, if you see any other organizations or people who are working on this, you know, they all deserve the support. I mean, uh, it isn't sort of like, um, you know, in the, in the proper spirit of solidarity, I think we all want to see as many of these kinds of things uh, seed and prosper, whether it's in Europe or Canada or America or what have you. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think, you know, in one of our sessions, this was asked, like, why was, why has this not happened? I mean, for me, it seems like a real, um, but maybe, I, you know, I'm showing my biases here, but um, I think it's a real no-brainer that, that the arts should be included. But I also think it's a real, unfortunately, it's a very indicative uh, of the position we are at time in late stage capitalism as to why something that isn't about making money is not at the core <laughs> of a massively funded project. And I'll leave it at that. But thank you so much for having us. I always, ever since I, I was uh, in, in Manitoba, um, doing a project with Shep at, you know, I, I, it's, I've got a real soft spot for that place. And so I, I, I'm very happy to be connected in this way again. So thank you. Thank you both.